Hello, welcome to another video from Back to Basics Bushcraft. In this video, I'm going to be going over my personal bushcraft kit, what I like to carry with me on my trip into the wilderness, and why I like to carry it. You'll see that there are quite a few items laid out here, um, and that's because I like to take as much as comfortably possible on my trip to make my trip as smooth. Uh, cooking items, shelter items, things of that nature. Uh, if I'm planning that type of trip, I want to make sure that I take, you know, enough kit with me that my trip is smooth and I'm not wanting for any type of shelter item or cook item or uh, any little small detail that, oh, I wish I'd brought this. would have made this easier. So I've, I've tried to plan out for some contingencies. Not every contingency can be planned for, but that's why... Uh, I quote Ray Mears, bushcraft is what you carry in your mind and your muscles. So, with that said, we're going to start getting into my kit. And we'll start with the pack. <clears throat> this pack I picked up at a yard sale. I'm not sure of the brand, but it's an external frame. It's got a, uh, a nylon... Uh, material. It's been waterproofed um, with, I'm going to presume, like a PVC silicone type, but it has several compartments. It's got two main compartments, one at the bottom here, and then one here. And with that, you've got a side compartment here, a side compartment here. This front compartment, which you see I've marked with a cross, which is my first aid items and should anyone open the pack they know that the first aid kit is in here medical items and then we have a, a compartment on the side here and a compartment on the side here and then when the flap is over the top of the pack there's a compartment here so you've got plenty of storage you don't have to jumble everything into one place in the pack and, and have to unpack a bunch of things to get to something else and that's something personal to me I, I've had a packs in the past that are are you know one big compartment and maybe one or two side compartments and you find that you've had to essentially play Tetris to pack all your gear into this pack and then trying to decide what you're gonna immediately need for cooking or something like that whereas with this kit with this this pack here I can set it up how I want and be able to access anything I need at any moment my shelter inside here <clears throat> you know, my, my shelter kit inside here, my cooking kit inside the top pack here, other small items inside there, and then various things for the other compartments. But uh, down below, you'll see strapped to the pack, I've got my sleeping system here, which comprises the modular sleep system's black liner from uh, the, the uh, MSS. It's uh, good for two seasons, probably spring and summer. I wouldn't use it solely in the winter, which is why I also carry two uh, military surplus wool blankets. The gray, not the green, the gray wool blankets tend to be just a little thicker in their, in their weave than the green, <clears throat> so you get a little more warmth. With those two wool blankets and this sleeping bag, I've been pretty comfortable down to, you know, in the teens. Uh, and nice and warm and toasty. Uh, I haven't been any colder than that yet because of where I live. It, it doesn't get, you know, really below zero here. However, I'm pretty confident that um, those three kit items will keep me very warm in the environments in which I tend to uh, want to go on a trip. Uh, if I were to decide to go somewhere where it's colder than zero, then I'd probably uh, arrange to have the proper equipment. So hypothermia can can probably be a, a real bummer for a, a good trip. So, turning the pack over. <clears throat> you see the external frame. Uh, I've got a couple of pieces of, of 550 cord tied on here for um, just for preparedness sake. Uh, tie a piece of, of gear off, an extra piece of gear that I decided to carry with me. Um, so, you've got your shoulder straps here which are adjustable. Both are adjustable. Now, 
this is something that is probably never truly thought about, but it's a very good idea to carry. This is a, a little a safety whistle. Doesn't take much effort to make a sound out of that. And the reason I have that is, if I'm injured, worst case scenario, if something happens to me and I get injured on my trip, and there happen to be people near enough to hear that whistle and I can't yell out for help, the international distress sign is, is three blasts on a whistle or a horn uh, or something. So I can give three short and I don't have to worry about wasting the energy to scream if I have the energy to scream or if I don't I'm injured and I can't yell um, there's a story of a, a couple who were hiking in the mountains <clears throat> and they both fell one of them fell and I believe he was killed the other fell and was uh, I guess trying to get to him and fell and was injured and screamed for a couple of days and screamed to the point that they could no longer scream and no one could hear them and they just happened to be found because someone took a picture through a digital camera and saw a shape in that picture and recognized it as possibly a person and that's how she was found. If not for that, she would have died. Exposure, starvation, dehydration, a horrible death. So had she had one of these, when she saw someone, she could have given a couple of blasts on this and they would have said, that's not normal. They would have investigated and found her much sooner. You know, thank goodness she was found anyway. But it's not a bad idea to have a safety whistle attached to your kit somewhere, or even your person. The other item I have attached to my kit is a little flashlight. Now it's not super bright as you can tell, but it does give me enough light to light the area about 10 or 15 feet in front of me. You know, if I need a, a spotlight on something, uh, it, it gives me that. And you know, I carry a headlamp as well, but not a bad idea to have a, a flashlight. This is, you know, easier to get to. Um, should I be walking and, you know, it starts to get dusky and, and I don't have my headlamp yet, so I have this light that will light my way enough 10 or 15 feet in front of me, which is, is plenty enough light for me to see what's going on in front of me there. So, moving forward. 50 feet of uh, climbing rope, it's about 20 millimeter climbing rope with an actual weight rated carabiner attached to it. Uh, this can have many, many uses. It can be used as a ridge line when setting up my shelter. It can be used for hanging food in a bear bag, should I want to hang food up in the air if I find myself in an area where there are possible bears. Um, in an emergency, I need to go down a mountain, you know, just many different uses but I've got about 50 feet of climbing rope in my kit and the reason I have weight rated climbing rope is I would much rather know that I have something that is weighted or weight rated and trusted than to buy a, uh, some rope and think it might be and then have it fail same thing with a carabiner a carabiner and a d-ring are two different things carabiners will actually have your information stamped on the side the manufacturer's information weight rating, static weight rating, dynamic load weight rating, all of that will be stamped in here to tell you and it'll give you all of that information here. So make sure that when you're picking up a carabiner that you know the difference between a carabiner and a D-ring. A D-ring is not weight rated. It'll hold a few things but it is by no means to be used for climbing. Carabiners are weight rated and they have a lock so they can't be opened. So again, carabiners, weight rated, lock. D-rings, not weight rated, don't lock. Inside this little pouch, I've got about 100 feet of paracord, which is in addition to paracord attached to some of my kit items. And then the straps for my hammock setup are in this pouch. So I've got this pouch with my paracord and my straps for my hammock. 
this is my shelter tarp. It's about 10 foot by 10 foot and it folds up into its own little pouch. You know, about the size of a, a child's football, a junior little football. I think I can even compress it into the size of a grapefruit. So it takes up very little room in my kit. It weighs about, about a pound, so not very heavy. Same thing with this hammock. This hammock is weighted uh, 300 pound capacity. It's got the straps, like I said, that came with it, and it compresses into its own little bag and weighs about a pound, so, and about the size of a, a grapefruit or uh, maybe a cantaloupe. So that's about the room that it takes in my kit. <clears throat> mentioned the headlamp earlier. Now, cutting tools. When I take a trip, even if it's just for a day, I carry at least two cutting tools on me. I've got a belt knife, which everyone recognizes this is the Mora Garberg, and I don't need to go into any detail about that. There are plenty of reviews on it. Um, I've attached my own little uh, paracord lanyard, kind of a bright orange color makes it stand out if I happen to drop the knife I can at least see it to find it and then uh, my own little personal way of carrying it my own little belt thong that I've made here and then some brightly colored beads you know my favorite colors on there so a belt knife <clears throat> and a pocket knife those are the two minimum cutting tools I'll take with me if I'm you know even if it's just a day hike the two minimum tools I'll take a belt knife and a pocket knife. This is a little two blade uh, pocket knife. Blades are about two inches long, two and a half inches long. Next, if you're taking a trip for more than a day, you'll want to carry, in my opinion, a pack axe or a hatchet of some kind. I've got my own pack axe that I carry. It's a single bit, um, 18 inch handle. I've got one inch notches made into the back of the handle. Uh, I'll go into those and the reasons behind those in another video. I've got a little homemade frog to carry it on my belt. It's just an old belt that was falling apart and uh, I turned it into a little frog for my hatchet. And it slides right in there and then hangs from my belt. And the reason behind this is if I'm doing any kind of wood processing, I need to place my ax somewhere. So I wanna hang it on my person. This way I don't lay it on the ground and either lose it or I don't walk with it in my hands with the blade edge exposed and possibly injure myself. So even with the blade edge exposed, having this hang, I've got a modicum of safety with this hanging from my belt. I'm not worried about falling on this or dropping it and injuring myself or possibly losing or damaging the ax. Next, if I'm taking a, like I said, an extended trip, the next tool for cutting that I take is a folding saw. Now, I prefer the buck saw type. You can take one like that was the Baco Laplander or the Silky saw. That's your choice. I choose to take a folding bow saw. This one's made by Eka from uh, Eskilstuna, Sweden. And it's very quick to set up. And there we go. Now. If you're not very experienced in axemanship, having a saw is a much safer option. Yes, in some cases it can take more time. However, if you're not as adept at using an ax, you're not as experienced, then take a saw. Because the last thing you want to do is be inexperienced with a tool and injure yourself out in the wilderness. You can cut a trip short. So a folding saw, plus there's a lot more, uh, I'm sorry, there's a lot less wood waste when you're cutting your firewood 
with a saw than there would be with an ax. You know, you've got chips and chunks out of the tree. Granted, those can still be used, but there's a lot less waste if you're cutting wood with a saw than with an ax. Just my opinion. Next, um, I'll just go back this way just to make the make it easier on the video. Got a little bit of cotton t-shirt material here. Um, several uses for this, but I carry a couple of candles just for lighting, and then there's wax. Wax has a lot of uses for things like waterproofing, you know, a material, or even waxing the wood handles on your your cutting tool, like your axe, or even a, a knife to help you know waterproof it. But uh, it's never a bad idea to have a candle. It's never a bad idea. Again, you can, you know, light your camp. You know, maybe you don't want to build a fire and you just want to have a little bit of light to, you know, if you've carried a book with you, you want to have candle light. You don't have to build a big fire. So, I've got three little candles here. I think they'll burn probably, you know, three or three hours a piece. I'm not sure, but uh, carrying them with me. This, I call this my little fishing possibles kit. I've got about 25, 30 yards of fishing line with some swivels. I've got a couple of various size fish hooks in here and some weights. And then I think these are used to hold in curlers, but uh, you know, they can come in handy to do a lot of things. Um, again, a little possibles kit. I don't know, I saw these and I thought, ah, I'll just throw them in there. What, what harm could it be? They don't weigh much of anything, maybe a gram or two, I don't even know, but they don't take up much room, so. And then I've got some uh, artificial sinew with a sewing needle for, you know, maybe some on-the-fly repairs of clothing or, you know, my pack or my shelter, um, you know, crafting different things. The sinew can come in very handy, so that's that. And then this little kit right here has uh, I've got some snare wire, another needle with some waxed thread on it, uh, a few various size nails, just, I, you never know, could need them, maybe not, but doesn't take up much room and maybe weighs a couple of ounces, three, three ounces or so. The obligatory first aid kit, this is a one to two person first aid kit, I've got various bandages and some antibiotic ointment, tweezers, scissors, a tick remover. Uh, I highly suggest if you find yourself in the southeast or anywhere that you've got grass and, and woodland areas, ticks are a possibility here where I am. Ticks are a guarantee. So get a tick remover. You can buy them at Walmart, you can buy them hardware stores, but uh, just it, it makes removing a tick a lot easier. Real quick expansion on that. When you have a tick attached to you, one of the reasons you get a sickness from the tick is if you go to remove it and you squeeze the tick, they regurgitate. And if that tick has any type of parasite, any type of disease, he'll regurgitate that back into your bloodstream. So buy a tick remover. It removes the tick without squeezing the tick. So buy a tick remover. I have a Sharpie because I have a tourniquet. This is the CAT combat, uh, combat application tourniquet. Uh, if you place a tourniquet on someone, you wanna write in a very conspicuous area, usually the forehead, T for tourniquet, time you put the tourniquet on, and the location of the tourniquet. So, there's my first aid. This is my fire kit. I'll go in detail on that, but I've got a fire steel or ferro rod, or as Morris Kohansky, rest in peace, likes to call it the metal match. I've got char cloth, I've got a Bic lighter in here, I've got some matches, I've got several redundancies inside here. And once again, more detail on that in another video. This is an old surplus M16, M14 magazine pouch from the military. Uh, it was in a, a, a box of stuff that I bought from a uh, yard sale, as it was, uh, you know, a hodgepodge of things and I decided to repurpose it as my fire kit 
So again, I'll go into more detail in that in a, a later video. I've got my headlamp. It's got four settings, sort of bright, nice and bright, really bright and uber bright. Uh, this is a Princeton Tech. Um, a headlamp is a great thing to have. Freeze your hands up so you, you know, you can see and use your hands. So carry a headlamp. Now when I carry a headlamp, of course, you always carry spare batteries. I'll carry at least three sets of spare batteries. This is, I think, about 20, 20 feet of duct tape, maybe less. Uh, it's Gorilla Tape, a very good brand of duct tape. It's good and sticky and good and strong. So, and like they say, if you can't fix it with duct tape, it's really broke. This is a little pouch I made out of a pair of jeans. Uh, this is just something I take with me. If I decide that I want to grab some wild edibles out, uh, I have a pouch in which to carry them. Um, it also can carry, you know, I find little little stones, any little thing I can you know, throw in here and I have a little pouch to carry it. This is a little journal that I'll take with me. Uh, it's a good idea to take a journal with you. You can write down things that you've observed uh, and just keep up with, with your, your journey. Um, and then you can look through it one day and look at your lessons learned and things you want to do differently or, you know, have a record of your journey so that maybe one day you want to pass it down. You, you have a way to, to, to accurately describe what happened and remember it. So, and it's in a Ziploc bag just to keep the elements off of it. Another tool. It's a Gerber multi-tool. You've got your pliers. Uh, there's a file flathead and Phillips head screwdriver, a pocket knife blade, and then this little tool right here, which I'll go into the uses of in another video, is an awl. When you use one, you'll wonder why you never carried one on every trip. And then of course, <clears throat> you've got a can opener, bottle opener right here. Surveying tape, marking tape, this is bright green. This color does not appear in nature, Therefore, it's very visible, very conspicuous. Now, if I'm hiking in the woods and I decide that I want to start walking away from, oops, excuse me, start walking away from my uh, my campsite, I want to blaze a trail so I can get back easier. Granted, you know, land navigation is a good skill. However, it makes it so much easier if you have a way to mark your trail. Now, I personally don't like to mark trees <clears throat> by scraping off bark. I don't want to damage them. This. This little guy right here is a wonderful addition to the kit because I can tie it off at about eye level on trees and see my way back. And then I can remove it as I come back so that I don't leave any trash in nature. And I don't do any permanent damage to the plants around me. So a little bit of surveying tape. I think they come in like 100 foot rolls or something like that, but you can see that even a 100 foot roll, smaller than a hockey puck, and it's a very light piece of kit. Carrying your cutting tools, you need a way to maintain them. So I have my own little sharpening stone that I made. This is a diamond abrasive on one side and then a, a ceramic uh, corundum, or yeah, carborundum, maybe. Uh, on the other, fine side, medium side, just to maintain my edge in the field. I don't wanna have to try to find two flat rocks and make them work, so I carry this little guy right here. Next, I have my little navigation and uh, other items here. I've got a Silva compass with a 5X magnifier on it, which helps in fire starting, but uh, you know, a Silva compass with, it's actually got scales for protractors on uh, two sides. I have a signal mirror here and uh, we'll go into the uses of the signal mirror later on, but I've just got a small signal mirror here. <clears throat> I've got some right in the rain paper, just as a redundancy, a backup, or if I need to leave a note somewhere, say I'm, I'm affecting a self-rescue and I know that people are looking for me, I'll leave a note. I'm headed in this direction and, uh, you know, 
there again, you know, plan ahead, I guess. Mylar space blanket or emergency blanket. Now, Morse Kohansky brought up a very good point in one of his videos that this is not really a blanket. Mylar is a reflective surface. So what it does is it reflects your body heat back at you so that you don't lose that body heat. So don't have one of these thinking that as soon as you wrap yourself in it, you're immediately gonna get warm. Your body heat has to be reflected back to you. So the use of a Mylar blanket is actually to put it behind you and build a fire in front of you and reflect the heat back at you. Again, more videos later on to go into detail about that. Now, we get over into my cooking setup. I got quite a few items, but that's because, again, I want my trip to be nice and smooth, and I want to enjoy it as much as possible. So what I've got here is, I've got an old military surplus uh, cook kit. It's got the, uh, the skillet and the little two-section plate. And then I have a, uh, a spork from Light My Fire that I keep in it. So that's that part of it. I've got a, a military canteen, you know, holds about a liter of water, I reckon, and a canteen cup. This is a percolating coffee maker. I took the little percolator out of it because I know how to make coffee without having to percolate it. And to be quite honest with you, the bush coffee or cowboy coffee tastes amazing and you don't have to percolate it. And if you do it right, there'll be no grounds in your coffee. But uh, it's also a way to boil water should I need to. But what I did was I kind of crimped out the sides so that it would snap in, the lid would snap in and it wouldn't fall out as easily. So, and then I have a little uh, one and a half quart cook pot. I've modified it myself. I made a bale handle on the top so that I can hang it and then have a handle here so that I can pour. I also bent out this little area here so that I can leave the lid on and pour out liquid and not lose anything inside. So, there's my cook kit. So, that's my kit that I take for an extended uh, trip into the wilderness. Uh, even if it were just gonna be an overnighter, I wouldn't shake my head at taking all of this gear because it doesn't weigh a whole lot. Like I said, it, it weighs about somewhere around 30, 31 pounds. Um, so it's not overly cumbersome to take in the woods and, and in, in a, a rucksack or a pack that has a frame to it, you can adjust it and tighten it to yourself so the load is actually a part of you and you don't have as much fatigue in carrying it. It doesn't bounce around, it doesn't drag you down, it's almost like it's a part of your body. So, oh, one last thing, and I'm surprised I missed it, but this... <clears throat> Anyone who's ever hiked in bear country can tell you that having a bell on your person will help keep you from surprising a bear because a good many bear attacks occur because someone surprised the bear. If you have a bell or some type of noisemaker that doesn't sound like noise in nature, it will help mitigate a bear attack. I won't say eliminate, I will say mitigate. So don't hold me responsible if you're wearing a bell in your hike and a bear comes at you. It's supposed to help keep you from surprising the bear. Anyhow, so, I hope that I've given you a little insight into uh, a bushcraft kit or a woodcraft camping kit. Um, these are, again, the things that I like to take on my kit, uh, or take in my kit on my journey. Your personal preference may be different. Uh, you may want to add, you may want to take away. And once again, this also depends upon what your goal is on your personal trip. If I wanted to go out and say, I'm 
it's gonna take an overnighter with nothing but the minimum of gear. Okay, maybe I just might take a belt knife. If I'm really gonna prove myself and test myself, maybe I just might take a pocket knife. Maybe I might just take my ax. You know, it, again, it goes back to your goal on your trip and what you want to accomplish. But I, on a trip that I'm planning out that I know I'm gonna be gone for more than one day, if I'm gonna be gone for two or three days, I'd like to take enough gear to make my trip enjoyable, make the most out of my trip. So this is what I like to take. Hope you enjoyed watching. Please feel free to comment. I simply ask that you keep them professionally critical and family friendly. Take care and be blessed.